On the 18th of May 2007, a clandestine flight takes off in Gibraltar destined for Florida in the US. By the time the flight lands, its cargo of $500 million in sunken treasure has become a topic of conspiracy that sparks an international legal battle. Million dollar fines, political sabotage, war between Spain and England and unanswered questions like, will they do it again? Odyssey Marine Exploration is set up in 1994 by John Morris and Greg Stem. The company is founded in Florida on the premise that the world's oceans are filled with lost treasure in sunken shipwrecks and the technology now exists to find and recover it responsibly. This isn't exactly a small ship. They have a crew between 10 and 20 people, an ROV, sonar to scan the ocean floor, a huge underwater suction hose that can reach thousands of feet deep to suck up any loose treasure they find, and a crane to haul up heavy metals like gold and silver. I imagine they bought something like a second-hand supply ship with a large open deck which they could use to install their equipment. The ship would have cost around $5 million and the extra equipment could easily add another $5 million. They then need around $30,000 a day to run the ship which adds another $10 million a year. The cost of treasure hunting adds up and there's no reasonable expectation that they find a treasure in their first few months, but they've stacked the odds in their favor. It's almost like prospecting where a geologist says he thinks there's a gold deposit and then you have to drill test holes to confirm if there's gold. Odyssey Marine has historians who research shipwrecks to find the wealthiest hall where there is a strong indication of a location to search. Then Odyssey send their ships to that location to scan the ocean floor with sonar to find those shipwrecks. And not the local shorelines where most shipwrecks have been found. They want the deep ocean where shipwrecks have laid dormant for hundreds of years, untouched by the relentless ocean storms that ravaged the shallow water shorelines. Some predictions estimate over a million sunken ships are still unaccounted for today and hold hundreds of billions in fortunes lost to the ocean. Odyssey Marine is perfectly poised to find and recover these treasures. They invest significantly in capabilities including ships, sonar, ROVs, engineers, scientists, archaeologists and historians. As an underwater archaeologist himself, Odyssey founder Greg Stem even worked with UNESCO on the draft convention for the protection of underwater cultural heritage. Not only do they want to find treasure, but they also want to preserve the history that accompanies their finds. These are archaeologists who want to find treasure. In their first years, they make some small discoveries. In 1997, Odyssey Marine Exploration lists on the New York Stock Exchange. The funds they raise help to expand their reach and to fund years of research and discovery. For a number of years, Odyssey scans the oceans looking for sizable treasure. But life at sea is tough and the ocean doesn't give up her secrets easily. By the year 2000, Odyssey's share price is down to $1.60. Now, if you look at Odyssey's website on Wayback Time Machine, you'll see that they have what I like to think of as a charter. A charter in this case is the deployment of a ship for a specific purpose and that purpose is to find treasure within the framework of the charter. In this charter they say four main things. The research will indicate a wreck is in deep water so it hasn't been covered over by storms. The wreck has a sizable potential monetary value to pay for the expense of recovering it in a responsible way and to return value to shareholders. It must also have good navigational information to limit the search area. And that they need to work out who owns it and negotiate any financial compensation for salvaging the ship before they start any recovery operations. You see, ships lost at sea probably or possibly still have an owner. Just because it's lost at sea doesn't mean there's no owner. Of course, ships that sank hundreds of years ago might not have an owner to claim the ship and its cargo. To start the process, you need to register your own claim on the ship in a court, and so Odyssey also have a team of lawyers. In 2001, Odyssey Marine finds the wreck of a ship they believe may be the HMS Sussex or Her Majesty's ship Sussex. 
The HMS Sussex was hit by a storm and sank in 1694 with gold coins that would be worth $500 million today. Odyssey makes a legal claim on the shipwreck called an arrest of cargo and they send their lawyers to speak to the governments of the UK. You see, even though the shipwreck is in international waters, it's still owned by a sovereign nation. It was a Royal Navy ship when it sank, which means it's owned by the British government. Unlike a private person or organization that could cease to exist, a sovereign nation will maintain their claim in perpetuity. Much like their charter says, Odyssey negotiate with the UK to retrieve the treasure for the UK. They have the expertise to accomplish the task and so a year later they agree a fee. Odyssey would get 80% of the proceeds up to $45 million, 50% from $45 million to $500 million, and 40% above $500 million. The British government would get the rest. But in 2003, when they're ready to start documenting and excavating the site, the archaeological community slows things down when they point out that it opens the doors to archaeological sites being ransacked by treasure hunting companies. While this plays out, Odyssey continues to search for another wreck that meets their criteria. Preferably a privately owned one where the owner no longer exists. The law of fines says that if someone finds a privately owned ship in international waters and the owner no longer exists, then they can keep it. The next best prize is finding a privately owned ship where the owner is still around and is happy for them to quickly salvage their lost possessions. This would be like a ship carrying steel that gets hit by a storm and sinks, so the owners call in a salvage company to retrieve the steel and the ship so they can salvage whatever value is left. As a salvage company, Odyssey puts itself in harm's way to recover a shipwreck, and so they should be compensated for that, provided they act in an honest way in their undertakings. That would be represented as a percentage of the value of the ship and cargo. And this is what they find in 2003 with the steamship Republic, which is found in 1700 feet of water, approximately 100 miles off the coast of Georgia in the US. The wreck site is meticulously documented and the recovery appeared in a 2004 documentary by National Geographic called Civil War Gold. $75 million of Civil War era gold coins are recovered. Artifacts from the ship are now in museums all around the US. This is the first major discovery by Odyssey Marine and it's not without any costs. The operation takes almost a year to complete at a cost of between thirty dollars and $50,000 a day. They also need to pay the owner of the ship, which in this case is the insurance company who paid out the insurance claim for the ship when it sank in 1865 and they're still in business today. Of course, the insurance company didn't have the resources to recover the wreck and so they negotiated a settlement. Odyssey Marine would pay them $1.6 million and then whatever they recover is theirs. Again, in accordance with their charter, they negotiate in good faith, document the site and preserve their findings for museums and maintain the highest archaeological standards. They're not only concerned about profitability for the shareholders of the company, which is listed on the stock exchange, they're also concerned about the preservation of the historical importance of their finds. By all accounts, these guys have a great charter. Make money from treasure hunting and preserve the history of the ships they find. In late 2005, after their success with the Republic, the UK give Odyssey the go-ahead to salvage the HMS Sussex and work begins to survey the site. And now the Spanish government enters the fray. They're concerned that Odyssey may have found a Spanish ship. In March 2007, six years after they first discovered the HMS Sussex, Odyssey finally gets the green light to continue their work on the site of the HMS Sussex, provided a Spanish archaeologist is on board for the surveys to ensure the ship is actually the HMS Sussex and not a Spanish ship of which there are plenty in close proximity. And here's where it gets interesting. In very quick succession, on the 4th of April 2007, Odyssey file a claim for the arrest of cargo on a new ship, an unknown ship which Odyssey codename the Black Swan. 
They do their due diligence and publish this arrest of cargo on the 7th of May and then on the 17th of May a flight takes off from Gibraltar with a reported 17 tons of gold and silver coins, lands in Florida and the treasures taken to an undisclosed location. This black swan turns out to be the biggest sunken treasure ever recovered, valued at over $500 million. Excited about their find, Odyssey publishes some photographs of the coins. At first, many believe it's from the Royal Merchant, which is one of the few known ships to have carried such a large haul. Others believe it's from multiple ships, but Odyssey refutes that claim, stating it's all from this one unknown shipwreck. The Spanish government are deeply suspicious of the timing and manner in which this shipwreck is recovered. On the 30th of May 2007, just weeks after Odyssey had flown the treasure to the US, Spain files a counterclaim against the treasure. Experts have examined the markings on the coin and found they're from the 1800s. This is past the time period of the Royal Merchant and would have been minted after the Royal Merchant sank in 1641. The most likely shipwreck is the Nuestra Senora de la Mercedes. On the 5th of October 1804, the Mercedes is carrying gold and silver coins as part of a four-ship flotilla returning to Cadiz in Spain from Uruguay. Nearing Europe, the group is intercepted by Admiral Graham Moore aboard the HMS Indefatigable and ordered to alter their route into a British port for inspection. Gibraltar was given to the British in 1713 to get them out of a war. And now in 1804, a Royal Navy fleet are intercepting Spanish Navy ships in waters that will always be contested between Britain and Spain. Jose de Bustamante Higuera, the flotilla's commander, refused to comply on the grounds both countries were at peace at the time and Moore had no authority over them. Despite being outmanned and outgunned, Higuera ordered battle stations. One single shot from the HMS Amphion hit the Spanish frigate's ammunition magazine which exploded. All cargo and 250 Spanish sailors were lost. Admiral Moore counted the gold and silver on the remaining three ships. He recorded that the four ships together were transporting 4.5 million pesos of silver and gold. According to the prisoners, 1.3 million of them were the property of the King of Spain. Spain declared war on Britain. Makes you wonder how the British knew what was in the cargo and were willing to go to war with Spain to capture it. Now we don't know when Odyssey Marine actually locate the Mercedes and for a long time they kept the location to themselves. In fact, in the weeks leading up to the point where Odyssey fly the treasure to the US, their ships go dark. Ships are fitted with a tracking device called AIS. This helps ships see each other and keep track of their locations. Odyssey turned off their AIS. Now, it's possible it was on the fritz, but it seemed to work while they came in and out of port and sailed in waters not associated with the wreck. But they did turn it on a few times while in the proximity of the wreck site, probably to let oncoming ships know they're working in the area. Now, what's confusing me is that in the previous finds, they've spent a long time negotiating with the countries or companies who could potentially lay claim to the ship and its cargo. A process that's taken many years. With this ship, Odyssey decides to forego any deliberation, ignore their own charter to settle any legal negotiations with owners, and they simply extract the treasure as quickly as possible and fly it to the USA. Have they learned that the process takes too long? Have they found that the Spanish government is not as open to the process as the UK or USA? Perhaps they feel that they're more likely to be able to win a court case if they can fight it on home soil. Back in Spanish waters, Spain goes on the defensive. On July 7, 2007, the Spanish Coast Guard intercept the Ocean Alert, an Odyssey Marine survey ship off Gibraltar, 3.5 miles from Europa Point. Spanish authorities board the Ocean Alert and forcibly escort her into the Spanish port of Algeciras. She's held for the next week until July 14th and then released by the Spanish Civil Guard. The government returned some of the crew's confiscated passports and allowed most of them to depart. The next clash comes on October 16th. Odyssey's 250-foot salvage ship, Odyssey Explorer, is intercepted. After passing the three-mile buffer zone surrounding Gibraltar, a Spanish Civil Guard patrol ship and naval gunboat stop the Odyssey Explorer. 
The UK condemned the act, stating the vessel was in British waters surrounding Gibraltar, but Spain refuted the claim, stating that the waters within 12 miles of the coastline are Spanish waters, except for the waters surrounding the port of Gibraltar. The Spanish searched the ship with a deliberate focus on finding information that might pin down the identity of the Black Swan ship. In the months that follow, Peru filed a claim against the treasure, stating it was Peruvian silver minted in Lima. They lose the case because Peru was a Spanish colony at the time and so treasure that the Spanish plundered from Peru actually belongs to Spain. The Spanish Minister of Culture declares that if Spain gets the treasure back, they'll share it with Peru in the spirit of common cultural heritage. Two years later, in June 2009, a judge determines the ship is the Spanish Navy's Nuestra Senora de la Mercedes. He rules in favour of Spain's claim of sovereign immunity. He did, however, order a stay on the treasure returning to Spain as the full appeal process worked itself out. In January 2011, Odyssey Marine claimed the US State Department are involved with negotiations to assist the Spanish government receiving the treasure in exchange for the return of allegedly stolen artwork to a US private citizen. The charges are investigated, but no evidence can be found to support the claim. In September 2011, the Court of Appeals upholds the lower court's findings and write in their ruling, we do not hold the recovered treasure is ultimately Spanish property. Rather, we merely hold the sovereign immunity owed the shipwreck of the Mercedes also applies to any cargo the Mercedes was carrying when it sank. Odyssey is ordered to return every ounce of the 17 tons of treasure. A pair of Spanish Air Force C-130s fly the treasure back to Spain. Three years later, in 2015, a court determines that Odyssey Marine acted in bad faith and abusive litigation and orders Odyssey to pay Spain a million dollars. They as much as say Odyssey knew exactly what it was doing and it was unsavory. Today, the Mercedes legacy is displayed in various museums around Spain for all the world to see. Peru never received the treasure promised to them. In August 2017, the Spanish Navy returned to the site and rescued two cannons named Santa Barbara and Santa Rufina, each weighing more than two tons. Spanish diplomat Guillermo Corral says that they were critical of Odyssey Marine's manner of extracting the treasure using a kind of giant vacuum cleaner and destroying the wreck site, which is also a marine cemetery. In the end, Odyssey had to give the treasure back and pay a million dollar fine. But it looks like they knew exactly what they were doing, turning off their AIS, allocating a code name, secretively extracting the treasure as quickly as possible, without any negotiations with the rightful owners who their archaeologists and historians would have identified. So why did they do it? To me, the real black swan conspiracy comes down to following the money. These guys set off to create a company with a great charter. Along the way, they learn it's very expensive, takes a lot of time, and for the best treasure, you're at the mercy of forces beyond your control. Think about it like this. You're busy losing your original investor's money, the 20 or 30 million dollars you didn't have lying around to kickstart this charter. So you list the company on the stock exchange to inject cash and keep you afloat long enough to make the next major discovery. And in doing so, you learn that treasure is not only in the gold and silver you recover, there's also value in the price of your stock. By tracking back along the price chart for Odyssey, you can match the spikes of their share price with the announcement of their latest find. Perhaps they found another way to extract value from a treasure they knew they would never keep. But chasing treasure you can never quite get your hands on is not a good long-term strategy. In 2009, Greg Stem and Mark Gordon start to discuss an idea that ultimately transforms the company. Odyssey Marine are now focused almost exclusively on mining undersea minerals. Their website says, our respect and passion for the ocean ensures we will accomplish our goals transparently and in a way that will provide immeasurable benefits in an environmentally and socially responsible manner. So what do you think? Were these guys archaeologists who want to go treasure hunting or are they treasure hunters with an archaeology degree? Did they want the treasure in their hands for the media in order to pump their share price? Do you wonder if they're going to act responsibly and transparently in mining for minerals on the ocean floor? And just how many coins from the Mercedes do you think they kept?